I'm James Garvey. I'm the CEO and founder of Self Financial. Um, I'm pleased to introduce everybody to Richard Cordry, the founding director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, the CFPB. So uh, before we get started, I just, I just wanted to give everybody you know, a quick history lesson. Um, you know, after 2008, 2009 financial crisis, uh, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act. And you know, Dodd-Frank overhauled uh, our you know, inner workings of the financial regulation in the US and created a new independent agency, the CFPB, to act as the financial watchdog of consumer protection. Uh, during Mr. Cordry's tenure at the CFPB, uh, he developed, implemented, and enforced uh, major systemic changes in how we get used credit cards, debit cards, mortgages, loans. Um, Mr. Cordry also led the enforcement against predatory payday loan practices and ostensibly strangled the payday loan industry into submission. And as a result, um, you know, all in, the CFPB has put about $12 billion uh, back into the pockets of consumers who had been wronged. So, um, you know, one thing, uh, I'm, I'm certain that, you know, without Mr. Cordry, uh, we would be paying more for everyday financial, financial products and services. So thank you for your service, uh, Richard Cordry, and, and, and welcome. My pleasure. Thanks, James. So... Uh, you know, a couple icebreaker questions before we get started. Um, and, you know, the format of this is going to be, we're going to do the first roughly 40 minutes of some Q&A, and then we'll open up to the audience for, for some questions and answers. So I, I read in Wikipedia that you are a four-time Jeopardy champion. Uh, what did you do with the money that, that, uh, that you won? <laughs> Actually, I was a five-time champion, which five was time. a trademarked term that Jeopardy had because in, in that era, if you won five games, you were unceremoniously retired and someone else was then allowed to take your place because they didn't want people to win too much money. They later relaxed that rule and along came a fellow named Ken Jennings who won more than 70 games in a row. And of course, all of us who had been retired after five games thought we certainly could have done the same, although I'm quite sure we couldn't have done that. I was actually prudent with my winnings. Uh, it's been a source of a kind of joke uh, over the years that uh, I repaid a certain amount of student loan debt with those winnings. So that was my strategy for paying down my student loans was to uh, go on a game show and, and see if I could make a lot of money, which I did. I actually made more on Jeopardy that year than I did working for the U.S. Supreme Court the entire year. So it did work for me, although I don't know that it's a strategy that can operate for the uh, millions of Americans with significant student loan debt in this era. Uh, awesome. Um, so, you know, one question I like to ask every, everybody that, uh, that joins my company is, you know, when, when you were an adult, um, you know, when you first became an adult, what was the first financial product that you got on your own? Well, I suppose it, it, for me, uh, depending on when you think I became an adult or whether I ever did, uh, when I went off to college, I had to open a bank account. Uh, and then later I went to school over in England and opened a bank account over there. Uh, but I would, I would say probably for me, it was uh, credit cards, which I think I opened uh, my first credit card or two uh, just after I went into the workforce. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, at some point I had, uh, no, I guess I never had an auto loan. That was also out of my Jeopardy winnings. So, uh, yeah, I'd say it was uh, credit cards. And later, of course, I had a mortgage, as, as most everyone does at some point if they own a home, uh, but uh, probably credit cards. So, you know, just to... Uh, get started. Um, you know, why, why did you write the book Watchdog? Well, actually, for a number of reasons, James. First of all, uh, I thought it was an interesting story to tell historically. It's not very often that there's a brand new agency created in the federal government, uh, and especially one that has to start from scratch. I mean, the, the more, most recent example of a new agency was the Department of Homeland Security, but that was more of a merger of 
of a number of other pieces of the federal government rather than a startup. Whereas what we had to do was actually start from ground zero. We started with no employees and build up ultimately to 15, 1600. And that took several years to do. At the same time, we had a mission that was unique uh, and, and singular in the federal government that no one had done before. And it was regarded as one of the omissions that had perhaps helped lead to the financial crisis of 2008, which was no attention really being paid to the customers of financial institutions, the consumers of consumer finance products, such as credit cards, mortgages, student loans, auto loans, which have come to be a much more dominant force in people's lives. So the book is about, it's about consumers, which is all of us, and the kind of struggles and challenges that we face in our lives. It's about the rise of consumer finance uh, in our lifetimes, which has become a major phenomenon in American society, and it dominates the lives of most households in America. And it's about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was put in place to help protect people, create a level playing field between the individual and the large financial companies and the big banks, uh, and to make sure that people are treated fairly, and why that is important and how we went about it, why we did what we did. Uh, and it's also a roadmap to the future for the CFPB, which is under different leadership now, less aggressive for consumers, uh, but this, this points the way toward a different future, perhaps under new leadership once again. And, and so, you know, I, in, the, in your book, there's a number of stories that, that you wrote about different consumers being affected. And, you know, what, what story kind of struck you the most um, in, in the book? You know, there's a lot of, uh, as you say, personal stories about consumers. I wanted people to be able to relate to this and think about the kind of things that happen to them in their lives or family members or friends. And we all you know, for example, everybody has a lot of awareness now of student loans because they have peers uh, and, and those peers' parents and even grandparents who are affected by that. Uh, the mortgage crisis was something that upset all kinds of families and communities across this country in 2008, and the early Bureau's work devoted a lot of attention uh, to that. Uh, but the, the, the stories that I tell in the book are stories about people typically who came to the Bureau with individual complaints. And those complaints led somewhere either to relief for the individual or to helping educate the Bureau about a particular problem or to prompting an investigation by the Bureau of a problem that might lead to an enforcement action. One of the best stories in the book that I, that I use frequently is the story of Ari and his father. He was a young service member, uh, typical of young service members. They're leaving home for the first time they're on their own to manage their finances for the first time. Often they're naive, unsophisticated, clearly inexperienced, and they are often targets for high cost predatory lenders in and around military bases. Uh, and this is a story of how Ari ended up getting stuck in a, auto, a truck loan that uh, uh, he bought a used Dodge Ram truck. And because of uh, undisclosed fees and misleading Adam products, he ended up uh, being stuck with a loan for 70% of his take-home pay mm -hmm. that was payable out of his government salary before the money ever hit his bank account. He didn't realize that he had options on that. Uh, they told him it was mandatory to do that. Uh, and when he told his father about it, turned his finances over to his father when he was deployed to go overseas, his father was outraged, ended up coming to the bureau with his complaint after getting no luck anywhere else. And of course, you go back to the company and the first thing they say is, did, did your son sign the paperwork? And he clearly had. Uh, so there was no relief there. But we did an investigation. We found that he and there was a string of these lenders around the country that were linked uh, by a common, uh, common link to a, to a particular bank. It was U.S. Bank. And there were 50,000 service members who'd been similarly defrauded in this way. And we got relief for all of them. Uh, and we also got the Pentagon to rethink its allotment program, which they ended up amending so that it could not be misused for high cost electronics and, and uh, car and truck loans that are so common around these bases. So to me, that's a story that talks about how the individual consumer got stuck 
didn't realize that there were many others in his similar situation, how would he know that? Uh, came to us, we were able as a government agency to investigate it and use our powers to solve his problem, to solve the problem for 50,000 others, and ultimately to solve a systemic problem uh, for service members for years to come. That's government being effective, uh, being responsive to the voices of individual consumers, not just to those at the top, but, but the middle class, working class Americans. And to me, that's the story of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in a nutshell. You know, it's a, it's a great story because if you think about, you know, what, what would that consumer have done if the CFPB wasn't uh, around? Um, because you know, there, th this idea of a complaint database, you know, is, is, was really innovative. And I'm just trying to think for my own self, like what, what would I would have done prior to the CFPB? How would I have addressed that? What, what do you think? Well, you can see from the story here because you can see what Ari and his father did prior to actually stumbling upon the CFPB, which of course they'd never heard of. It was a brand new entity at the time. Uh, they went to various places, they complained for a while, and eventually they would subside and yep. you absorb the loss because there's nothing you can do about it. You feel frustrated, you feel uh, abused uh, and mistreated, but you just have to sort of take it. Uh, and that's how uh, consumers have felt for years with the big financial companies. You know, they can't either can't get a response or when they do get some kind of response, they get the runaround and, and nothing is done. That happened frequently to mortgage holders during the financial crisis of 2008, and which became a foreclosure crisis. And so many millions of Americans lost their homes in part because they couldn't have meaningful discussions back and forth with mortgage servicers who either weren't set up to do that or had no desire to do it, didn't want to dump the money into uh, having some kind of customer response function. God forbid that they should spend their time or waste their time on that. Uh, and as, re as a result, they ended up with many properties in foreclosure, which was much more cumbersome, much more time consuming, much more expensive for them. And as sometimes happens with financial companies of a too big a size, they end up cutting off their nose despite their face. They don't realize where their own self-interest lies. And the foreclosure machine was actually one of the worst ways to try to respond to the, the housing crisis and the mortgage crisis of 2008. And it bedeviled the economy, uh, slowed it down for years. And, you know, speaking of, uh, of crisis, um, you know, with, with COVID-19, what, what do you think consumers need to be looking out for now? Well, there's a lot of things. Uh, I actually published a white paper recently with a couple of my former colleagues, uh, Diane Thompson and Chris Peterson, in which we uh, called out the CFPB, the current leadership, because we, we believe that the CFPB is really misjudging this urgent moment for consumers. I mean, what do we have? We have a brand new uh, economic crisis on our hands. It's a very different crisis from 2008. Uh, in fact, I'm just publishing an op-ed uh, tomorrow uh, about how the last crisis was created by mortgages, this cr crisis by a pandemic. But although the causes are different, the trajectory is very different, the effects on consumers, once you have a recession with consumers losing their jobs and not having money coming in, become very similar. Uh, that threatens their ability to pay their mortgage or pay their rent, threatens their ability to stay in their, their home. Uh, it threatens their ability to make their auto loan payments and potentially lose their car or truck. And in many parts of the country, that's a catastrophe for a family where we don't have good mass transit, transit which is true of much of the country, uh, and that's a lifeline for people. They're behind on bills, uh, and they are stuck in a, in a very bad way. Uh, and that's what many consumers are starting to experience now. As we've just had, we had brand new numbers again this morning. It's now a total of over 33 million people have filed new unemployment claims in the last six weeks. And it's not just a temporary phenomenon. The number of continuing claims is rising significantly. And it's, that's up over 22 million now. So that's a lot of long-term pain that people are going to suffer. Uh, and consumers are going to be uh, behind on bills. They're going to be subject to debt collection, uh, harassment, and, and exploitation there. There's going to be a lot of problems for consumers, not just a few. And what do you think the companies servicing 
the loans should be doing, like the the auto loans, mortgage loans. You know, what what sh what should these lenders be doing? Well, the the smart thing to do when you're not getting paid, uh, which is difficult for companies too. Let's face it. Let's not sugarcoat that. Uh, the right thing to do is see if you can structure it such that people can pay as much as, as they can reasonably uh, and to make adjustments to the loan. The trouble with that is it's very time and labor intensive to do that. You have to have sort of automated ways of doing it. Uh, we learned a lot about mortgages in the last financial crisis, and there's been a more, uh, I would say, more congruent response this time to try to get relief to people so that they can forbear on mortgage payments. Uh, but one of the things we have to be careful of, that means that the companies that are receiving those payments and then allocating them to their own obligations don't have money coming in and there need to be financial backstops for them. Uh, the banks have financial backstops at the Federal Reserve and there's trillions of dollars being poured into the banks. Other mortgage servicers do not necessarily have any standard backstop provided. Uh, they're very thinly capitalized and many of them are gonna uh, teeter on the brink of bankruptcy. There have been some efforts now by the FHFA to provide that backstop. It's not clear whether it will be enough uh, and that's, that's a problem. But ultimately what you want is for people who owe something to have some sort of plan worked out so that they pay it over time uh, the alternative is that you get nothing from them and then you have to go after collateral and that becomes a very expensive, cumbersome process. Uh, but there's no good options uh, when you have the economy collapse as it's doing right now. And, you know, do you think that with respect to forbearance, it, is it a, you know, a three month forbearance, a six month, is it 12? How how do you balance the the needs you know of the of the consumer versus the the needs of of the companies that are uh, originating and servicing? Well, I think nobody knows for sure at this point, James. It depends on the extent of the uh, collapse. It just depends very much on the duration of the collapse. Uh, the problem with uh, a collapse that leads to high unemployment is that unemployment does not melt away very quickly. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office, which tends to be a fairly sober estimator, has estimated right now that unemployment will remain at 9% at the end of 2021. So we came into this uh, collapse with unemployment at historic lows of 3.5%. Mm -hmm. Remember, unemployment at the depths of the last financial collapse 12 years ago reached about uh, between 10 and 11 percent. So what we're talking about is unemployment almost at the levels of the last Great Recession lasting all through this year and all through next year. That's an enormous problem. I don't think the stock markets have priced in uh, the effects of that. That means consumer spending is going to be down over the long term. By the way, we also know that people who are building up debt right now, th there's no there's no, nothing easy about missing your mortgage payment because you know you're going to have to make it up at some point. Uh, and uh, if you miss it for two months, three months, that's an awful big lump that you're going to yep. be expected to pay back either, either immediately, which people will not be able to do and they'll go into foreclosure, or over time, uh, which will constrain their spending for, for the duration of that period. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of problems for consumer spending that grow out of this uh, economic circumstance we now find ourselves in. And consumer spending is actually the biggest driver of the economy. It's about two thirds of economic activity. So if it is on a reduced uh, trajectory, that means the economy itself will be on a reduced, reduced trajectory as well. Yeah, yeah, all, all of these uh, scenarios are not, uh, uh, are not good. And, you know, I, 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 when I was reading the book, I, I was just amazed that, you know, you created this agency, you know, from, from scratch. And can, can you just talk a little bit about some of the details on getting nominated and, and you know, how, how you were chosen and how you got through conf uh, Congress? And, and I, I think it's just a really fascinating story that, that people would love to hear more on. <laughs> 
Sure. Uh, and by the way, uh, we have always felt the CFPB a kinship with startup companies because we ourselves were a startup, uh, you know, very much so in the true sense of the word, you know, starting out in a few rooms with people packed five, six to a room, uh, you know, not having any good sense of how quickly we're going to grow having to deal with issues around space and around hiring and around recruiting, all the things that startups go through at the same time that you're actually trying to fulfill certain functions and perform. And of course, you're, you're for a long time performing with an understaffed uh, set of resources and it's, it's a tremendous challenge. Uh, at the same time, what sustained you and what sustained us was we had tremendous spirit uh, among the people who came to work at the Bureau. These were people who had seen the financial crisis. They'd seen the effects in their families, their communities. They wanted to come and do something about it. So they were tremendously mission oriented. I find that same to be true of a lot of fintech startups. And, and we always loved the spirit that we saw among uh, the, the people who go to work, uh, essentially because not just do they hope that they're going to end up uh, succeeding financially, but also they, they have notions of how to change the world for the better. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity out there. What I have learned is not just in the public sector with something like the CFPB, but in the private sector with uh, the various FinTech companies that are filling niches that some of the bigger companies have, have missed over the years. In our case, we faced this particular uh, set of challenges, which was that we faced a political landscape that was very fraught. Uh, and I, I talk in the book that some of this was uh, unexpected and some of it was uh, happenstance. But in the wake of the Dodd-Frank Act being passed in 2010, which set up and, and established and authorized this Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and many other things that pinched the financial companies, there was a political reaction uh, in the 2010 midterm congressional election, which was the Tea Party movement, which was against government spending, uh, against bigger government, uh, in favor of limited government, cutting budget deficits and the like. And by the way, we may now see a similar movement. We will see in the wake of the massive spending that we're seeing this year to deal with this uh, economic uh, crisis. Uh, you know, all of these restraints right now have been thrown out the window in a desperate effort to keep the economy afloat, but there will be a reckoning uh, as there was uh, 10 years ago. And suddenly we faced really hostile forces in the Congress that were aligned with the financial companies that were resisting our efforts to uh, rein them in and hold them accountable. And that created a political dynamic that was particularly difficult for us and lasted the entire time I was there. And I, I would say continues to be a part of the uh, dynamic for the Consumer Bureau since. You know, it, it's, um, I, I was just thinking about how the recession in 2008 is so much different than, than where we are today. Um, you know, with, with COVID, it, it's not a, uh, you know, it's not like big, big banks doing irresponsible things. You know, it, it's, it's a virus, it's, it's pandemic, it's, it's a, uh, a terrible, uh, terrible thing. And with consumer protection, what do you think is going to happen, you know, po post, um, post COVID? Are you going to see pushback or, or is, or do you think that the consumer protection is going to take a, um, you know, a backseat uh, to the health of the economy? So this collapse again reminds us that the economy is something of a paradox. It's a very, the, the economy is a very powerful engine and it drives prosperity in a very significant way. And you know, one of the challenges the federal government's facing right now is they, the people in the federal government within the Beltway in Washington, they believe that they're bringing, you know, titanic resources to bear on this problem. But those resources are actually puny compared to the overall massive nature of the economy as a whole. The notion that you know, one-time stimulus checks of $1,200 per person is going to somehow fill the gap for 30 million unemployed is, is, is really a fantasy or, or misjudgment. Uh, and so the economy is tremendously powerful. Uh, 
uh, instrument, but at the same time, it's, it's fragile. And it can be knocked off of its uh, equilibrium and its, and its harmonic uh, path by a lot of different things. And for example, we've had three different recessions in the last uh, 20 years, all caused by very different uh, uh, influences. The first one was the dot-com uh, crash, which was a fairly mild recession about 20 years ago. Then we had the financial crisis of 2008, which was, as you say, caused by irresponsible and predatory lending, typically in the mortgage market, uh, that became large enough and became um, uh, flowed through to the financial sector through securitization of these mortgage, uh, these mortgage um, packages such that it upset the economy. And now we have a pandemic, which is a very different cause and a, and a very different trajectory. By the way, the stunning nature of the current collapse is just how fast it has been. I mean, we actually came to a cliff. Normally, we kind of stumble into a recession and there's you know, often rising interest rates are part of the cause of the recession. Not this time. This was an absolute screeching to a halt of economic activity in this country. But what happens with any recession is then it takes on a life of its own, whatever it is that caused it. And sometimes those causes can continue to flow through and affect the trajectory as the mortgage market did the last time. But whatever causes it, suddenly as consumers, the backbone of the economy don't have income coming in. Either they've lost their jobs or they've had hours slashed, uh, whatever, whatever that may be. Uh, then you have new and compounding problems that, uh, that have to be uh, dealt with in a different way. And that's what we're having uh, now. Uh, you know, we've also had you know, a crisis in, in certain other sectors that somewhat unrelated, somewhat related to this, such as the energy uh, sector. So we have had compounding problems. But what I would say is that uh, right now, consumers are more in need of financial protection than ever because their situations are so leave them so vulnerable. And so you need a CFPB that's really going to step up to the plate and be effective right now at making sure that the financial companies are delivering high performance for their customers who really desperately need that right now. Take mortgage services, people servicing these mortgage loans. Supposedly under the CARES Act, about 60, 60 some percent of the mar market is entitled to mortgage forbearance. But if the mortgage servicers aren't, aren't performing effectively, if they have long call waits, if they have long call, if they have call abandonments, people can't get through, or when they get through, they are denied or, or put off in terms of what relief they can have, then that relief won't actually reach people. And so we really need mortgage servicers to be on top of their game right now. And instead, the current CFPB seems to be backing off and giving them leeway to sort of do whatever they need to do. Uh, but if they're not doing what consumers need them to do, consumers are going to bear the brunt of that. That has been my real uh, uh, complaint about the current CFPB leadership is I think they've misjudged uh, where, where this crisis leaves consumers in this country and misjudges their ability to do something meaningful about it. You know, and, and on that fact, um, what, what do you think about how the CFPB is handling uh, credit reporting and uh, the, the COVID situation? Well, again, uh, credit reporting is of a piece with debt collection, it's of a piece with mortgage servicing. The CFPB leadership's initial reaction was to sort of back off. Oh, this is a crisis for businesses. So we need to give businesses leeway. We need to give them more flexibility. Uh, we can't be, you know, pushing hard on them right now because they're going to be in trouble. Well, if you're a credit reporting company and you're not getting the oversight from your regulator that you need, uh, then you may be more lax in terms of how you resolve disputes or how you, you clean up errors in people's files. And by the way, there's going to be many more disputed items now. There's going to be many more debts being put into collection and reported to the credit reporting agencies. Uh, there's going to be a much higher volume of data coming in. And with a higher volume of data comes a higher volume of errors and problems. Uh, I talk in the book about the very common problem, and it's particularly true among certain ethnic groups where certain names are common, that people are mistaken for one another. And if there's 13 Barbara Andersons in a particular county, 
and one of them is a bankrupt and the, and the others are not, but somehow their files get confused, uh, you have all kinds of problems that people are cut off from access to credit uh, unjustly and inappropriately. And the credit reporting companies need to be performing at their very best right now to minimize these types of problems. Uh, and in, instead, the Consumer Bureau seems to be backing away and easing up on its oversight. I think that's exactly the wrong approach. You know, what, with um, the benefit of hindsight, um, hmm. are, are there any actions that you took at the CFPB that you regret or things that you would do differently? Yeah, I've thought a lot about that uh, over the years. And th the one thing I would say is I always wished we could go faster on all fronts because there, when we started out, there was so much to do. We could see so many problems in, in really every one of the markets that we touched uh, that we, we knew that we needed to really uh, put the pedal to the metal and move forward as quickly as we could. In the early days, a lot of our bandwidth on rulemaking was taken up by mortgage rules, which Congress required us to adopt seven rules in the first 18 months, which is a huge workload, especially for a new agency, but for any agency, really. Three of them were major rules. And that slowed us down in terms of things like the payday lending uh, rule and the arbitration rule, which we got to later than I would have liked simply because of, of human uh, constraints and, and capacity issues. Uh, we also, uh, we were stymied in part by uh, some constraints on our jurisdiction in, in the statute. The statute was very good in terms of authorizing the agency and giving us powers to write rules, to enforce the law, to oversee financial institutions. Uh, but there were a couple areas where we had troubles. I talk about in the book about auto lending. We had authority over auto lenders the people actually making the loans, but we didn't have authority over auto dealers who typically were right in the middle of getting the loan for the customer at the dealership. That's the, the you know, standard approach in that industry. And because we could only deal with one side of the table and not the other, it made it very difficult for us to make progress in some of the problems in auto lending that we thought needed to be addressed. By the same token, student loans. Uh, for, the for the duration of the Obama administration, we had a very good relationship with the U.S. Department of Education. Secretary Duncan and then Secretary King were willing to work with us and be very uh, collaborative with us. Uh, that was important because under the statute, we had authority over private student loans, but it was somewhat unclear exactly what our authority was over federal student loans. Didn't matter as long as we had a good working relationship with the Department of Education. But once Betsy DeVos came in under President Trump, all that cooperation kind of kind of went out the window uh, and it became much harder to be effective in that area. So it, there, there are various things that uh, I think uh, could have gone better. Uh, I wish they had, but there were a lot of things that, that went well uh, and that I'm very proud of in terms of what people did and what people accomplished uh, to improve life for consumers in this country and to show that the government can be effective for middle class and working class Americans. Again, not just those with the influence and cloud in Washington, which is what the financial industry uh, has to a considerable degree. Uh, as, as the director, were there ever an instance when you thought a company was doing something wrong and then you realized that they weren't? Actually, that happened all the time because what we would do is uh, on reasonable suspicion, which is a fairly low standard, the Bureau and any agency has the authority to open an investigation and to look into what you believe are alleged to be the facts and to see how those square up with what the law requires. You know, we opened a lot of investigations uh, that led to enforcement actions, and we opened a lot of investigations that we ultimately closed by taking no action simply because the facts didn't justify it. Now, there were also some times when we brought enforcement actions and they ultimately failed. We thought that things were a certain way and it turned out they weren't, or a court disagreed with our reading of the law. That didn't happen very often, but it did happen a few times. Uh, but it was very common for us to look into problems and then find that they were not really problems or they weren't problems that really justified the Bureau expending resources, particularly if it was a problem that didn't involve much real consumer harm, 
uh, then it wasn't going to be worth our while to prioritize that over something that involved more significant harm. And you know, when you started um, the bureau, fintech was barely a word. Uh, people were probably still calling it, you know, financial services or uh, or something else. But but today, you know, fintech is everywhere. Um, how how is how has fintech changed? Uh, in the last few years and, and when, since you started the Bureau? You know, some of these things actually show up when you're writing a book because, for example, do your editors believe that FinTech needs to be in quotation marks because that's not a common phrase and for those of us who are used to it, it's very much yeah. second nature. Uh, but, but in any event, uh, what we were trying to do at the Bureau, uh, and it was not an easy task to figure out, uh, although I think we made a lot of progress with it, was we had among the different congressional objectives that have been set up for this agency, the kind of purposes that were supposed to guide us, one of them said, and it was kind of a, kind of a head scratcher, that we were supposed to help facilitate innovation in financial, consumer financial products and services. Mm -hmm. and so the question you ask yourself is, well, how, how is a government agency supposed to help facilitate innovation? Isn't that something the private sector does? And frankly, what a government agency ought to do is just get out of the way. Uh, you know, arguably that's true. But at the same time, what we learned was that in the area of consumer finance, which is so heavily regulated and so closely detailed in its, in its regulations and prescriptions, the law is so heavy in that area that for a new uh, company that is trying to pursue a novel product or service, it often isn't at all clear how that novel product or service fits into the existing kind of comfortable, worked out hierarchy of rules and laws. And so one of the things a lot of fintech companies needed from us, if we could provide it, and it, it's always a challenge because you're trying to adapt it to something new, is could they get some guidance as to what, what was off limits, what was, what was allowed, uh, how, how were the gray areas going to be viewed here when they were doing something new and different? Was it going to be treated this way or that way? And so we ended up in a, in a dialogue, a very, very uh, constant and I would say heavy dialogue with a lot of the fintech companies to help them understand that, first of all, we were trying to encourage them in what they were doing. We saw that there was a lot of very consumer friendly efforts out there. Uh, we wanted them to continue down that line. And by the way, if you're a fintech company, what you are today isn't necessarily what you are tomorrow. You know, each round of financing and the pressures that can bring can change your outlook, or you can be under pressure to do something different than you did before because somebody tells you you need to do that uh, to, to survive, even though you don't think it's consistent with how you've been trying to approach the problem. So we were trying to kind of put our thumb on the scale of, of helping push the fintech companies in consumer-friendly directions while at the same time helping them ease their way through what was often a thicket of uncertainty that they were dealing with. And if we could peel back the uncertainty, uh, then they could get more, more headway. I, you know, we weren't always successful in that, uh, but I, I know that the effort was appreciated. Uh, I know that uh, our people who were ambassadors out there, uh, Dan Kwan in particular, who headed up our Project Catalyst program, uh, was very respected, I think, by the fintech companies, and they understood that he was somebody who could speak directly to me uh, and often get responses from the Consumer Bureau, uh, which is valuable for companies that are feeling their way and, again, are facing a lot of legal uncertainty in the early going. You know, move fast and break things, which is the, uh, the tech uh, motto, is not an easy motto to bring in to the realm of closely regulated uh, consumer finance. So that was that was one of the problems that fintech companies were trying to work through, and still are, I believe. Absolutely. I, you know, when I when I started Self, I I was trying to talk to anybody that that could you know help us. And as a software engineer by trade, um, you know, I I didn't I wasn't a uh, uh, attorney by trade, you know, and, and always get worried about, are we doing the right thing with respect to consumer compliance and, and regulation? And, and I, I met Dan Kwan uh, from the Project Catalyst program about five years ago. And uh, my, my first interaction with the government regulator was uh, extremely positive and, and, and exciting. Uh, 
And I remember talking to one of our attorneys about this and, and he was like, oh my gosh, you, you should uh, be careful before you talk to any, any regulator. Um, but it was a different approach that, uh, that the CFPB did. And, and I think one that you're seeing it emulated by other regulatory agencies uh, with respect to, to creating innovation offices. Yeah, I think you are not only here, but also uh, overseas. And a lot of them have, have drawn a lot of guidance from the project catalyst at the Bureau began. I kind of smiled as you were saying that because, of course, the reality is that very few fintech uh, startup uh, you know, CEOs and, and people who have a great idea about how to build a better product are really attorneys or know much about the regulatory scheme, and it's very foreign to them. And the initial reaction is to just put your head down and try to avoid it and ignore it. But that can lead to big problems if you end up on the wrong side of something. So we were trying to encourage people to, to develop that link and have that dialogue. Uh, and I think in many ways that, that was helpful on both sides. We also learned a lot from it. We learned a lot about what the fintech companies were doing. It helped us understand where other financial companies were falling short. Uh, and so it was definitely a two-way street. We, we benefited a lot by having those conversations and getting a better sense of what people were thinking and why. Yeah, you know, there's there's been a lot of innovation, and you know, some some of the some of the innovation that is fairly recent is the idea of using you know rent and utility payments and alternative data. Um, you know, the example people always like to, to throw out is you know your your Facebook likes are going to turn into a credit score that's going to you know, get, give you access to credit, um, which is, is obviously uh, ho hopefully not true and, um, and, and pretty, pretty scary. But uh, what, what, is your, what is your take on the use of, of the increasing use of alternative data? I think there's a tremendous amount of potential in alternative data. And, and let me just explain why I'm, I'm confident that is true. Uh, it has to do with the data we use now to, ass to assess credit worthiness that the credit reporting companies that have grown so large and so influential uh, that they use is based in part on some historical contingencies. So it has to do with definitions of credit and it has to do with access to data. So for example, over the years, there's been greater access to data about mortgages than there has been about rents and landlords. Uh, because landlord, the landlord population in the United States is so fragmented and there's never been any kind of central repository to accumulate that data. So where does a credit reporting company go? They go where the data is. And since there's more data on mortgages, they tend to, to use that data and they don't feel as comfortable finding data on rents because it's much harder to get at. The other piece of that is the definitional piece. A mortgage by definition is credit as we have defined credit. That is you borrow money initially and then you repay it over time. Rent is not that way. Rent we pay on an ongoing basis for a service provided. That's how it's defined. It could have been defined differently. Uh, we could have defined it as you rent out a, a, a place for a month and then you pay in arrears having borrowed that money ahead of time. But we've defined it differently and so rent is not considered credit. The same with utility bills. Uh, those are typically pay as you go and they are not considered credit. But do people feel any less importance in paying off those bills than they do their credit card bills or their auto loans? Well, you know, now that the phone has become a big lifeline for people and certainly electricity and gas uh, is such that I think people work just as hard to pay those bills as they do others. So should that affect, should that be influential in determining your credit worthiness, both your willingness and your ability to pay those bills? I think it should. But again, we ha they haven't had access to that data or it hasn't been defined as credit. And so to me, there's always been a lot that's been left out of a, a sensible assessment of people's credit worthiness. Now there are, as you say, other proxies that are being used and being explored. And some of them are potentially problematic because they may be uh, proxies for um, racial or ethnic or other types of prohibited uh, types of um, information about people. And we have to be very careful about how we correlate uh, those data that we aren't accidentally or inadvertently 
I don't think any of this is purposeful, uh, uh, having those kinds of problems. But I think that it's, it's undeniable that rent, utilities of various kinds should be part of this uh, data set. And if they are, we will have a much better sense of people's credit worthiness. The other approach that's been taken to this that has had enormous success is that when you can access people's financial flows uh, through their bank accounts and sort of see how, they, how the money comes in and out over time and get the sense of their patterns, that is in many ways a much better and a much fuller picture of their credit worthiness. And the companies that are doing that, I think are having a great deal of success. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that. I, I agree that um, it's, it's absolutely such a rich data set. Um, do you think that companies that, that offer financial aggregated data should be uh, regulated like uh, credit reporting companies? I believe they should, uh, and, and I believe that the, the best ones have recognized that and have been building uh, their systems to accommodate that, and I think that those who are not doing so will need to, to do so uh, and, and should. Uh, but uh, again, um, this is another, this is another uh, aspect, isn't it, of, of fintech companies coming into a more heavily regulated world. And I actually say the credit reporting world has not been as heavily regulated as, as the banking world, uh, so, although more so than, than a lot of industries. Uh, and yet there are, there are immediate questions of this kind that need to be sort of confronted and, and dealt with appropriately. Uh, and I think for those who are trying to skim around uh, the requirements, uh, they're potentially courting a lot of danger uh, and a lot of risk. And of course, in some of these areas like credit reporting, there are uh, there's opportunities for uh, private rights of action and lawsuits to be filed, not simply enforcement actions, and that multiplies the risk even more. Yep. You know, th there's also quite a few apps today in the App Store that are ostensibly allowing you to, to borrow money, um, but they're not calling it loans. And, you know, you, you connect your bank account and the basic flow is that you're you're borrowing from your future self um, because you have a job and it's a, a early a what was it called uh, earned wages or early wage access is is a, a common theme of this. What's what's your take on apps that are ostensibly lending but are are not? You, you know, using the same lending licenses that, uh, that others are, are uh, required to have. Yeah, we started uh, grappling with those issues. They started coming before us several years into the, uh, the time at the Bureau. And we found that e even just on the definitional side, some of these things can be very difficult to parse out and they depend on a lot of details. Um, I personally think that if you are uh, accessing wages that you've already earned, even though payday as it's defined for administrative purposes hasn't arrived yet, then you actually are accessing money that you are owed uh, and you're not borrowing. Uh, but, you know, whether, whether that is um, the nature of what's being done or whether in fact you are borrowing at times against wages not yet earned uh, and, and not yet paid, uh, or whether, you know, you're, how you're doing it, whether it's through the employer or through some third party that's funding money, you know, these can become very tricky questions. Uh, I do think that the principle of accessing wages that you've already earned, uh, and we, the reason you haven't typically been able to access that money in the past is simply because of administrative issues that had to do date back really to pre-computer days. Uh, when it was just more convenient for your employer to pay you uh, uh, at intervals rather than immediately. Uh, some of that is, is kind of outmoded now. And if you can access your wages earlier, a, a lot of people would benefit by that because it gives them a little more flexibility. Um, th this, is, this is also the other side of the economy that's difficult for so many consumers consumers who don't know from one week to the next how many hours they're going to work or how many hours they're going to be offered uh, 
uh, they count on a certain number, but they don't always get it. So sometimes their inflows uh, are very uneven. Their outflows often are uneven as well because those can be chunky at different times of the month. All this just demonstrates the complexity of consumer finance. And what we found at the Bureau, interestingly, was people who lived most on the edge, and many Americans do, uh, where you know they're, they're just one paycheck away from disaster, are often the most financially savvy. They have to be because every dollar matters and they're, they're constantly anxiously looking at this, looking at that. You know, those of us who over time can develop a little bit of a cushion don't have to be so focused day to day on all the little details. And often we aren't. And one of the great benefits of making some money and putting some money away is to be able to uh, de-escalate some of that anxiety that, that many people in America live with on a daily or even hourly basis. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to, to remind the audience that if you have questions, you're more than welcome to put them into the chat box. Um, but un until I get a couple more questions, I'm just going to go through my list. Um, what, what, I've, what we've heard is that credit card companies are, are pulling back right now uh, because of COVID, and they're not trying to acquire new customers. And instead, they're focusing on existing customers. What, why do you think that that's happening right now? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. They're all related to the fact that we're in an economic crisis. Uh, but for example, if you're a credit card company, right now you need to be very focused on your existing customers. Some number of those customers are not paying you. They're falling into arrears. And you're having to figure out the situations with them in terms of how you're going to handle that uh, and how you're going to manage through that. And that's pretty much an all-consuming issue in and of itself. Secondly, you may now not feel as confident about your models in terms of who's a, who's a good potential customer because it may depend enormously on circumstances that are changing very fast. I mean, the person who looked like a good potential customer a month ago, who now is unemployed and may get their job back but may not, all of those uncertainties, I think, are causing credit card companies to be very, to step very carefully right now uh, because they don't want to get some of that system systematically wrong. So uh, there, there's almost certainly other reasons as well. I mean, these companies are just overwhelmed with the sheer volume of other things besides credit cards, mortgage forbearances, and and other and other issues, uh, including keeping the business afloat and managing their own remote workforces in a in a time that's novel for everyone. But uh, I would say, from the credit card standpoint, particularly both of those aspects of things are likely to make them cautious for the moment about acquiring new customers. So I've got a question um, from, from Nick. And this question is, how did you measure success as you scaled the CFPB? Did you start with measurable goals? How did they change over time? Yeah, you know, that was a great question that we grappled with all the time because you know, I think ultimately what you'd like to have, if you could have it, is some sort of barometer of consumer well-being. Uh, and our financial education people groped for something like that uh, and, and continue to work on it. Uh, but it's trying to take a very complex, sophisticated set of things and boil them down into some sort of cruder measure. Uh, but if you could have that, and then you could see over time how consumers were, were doing um, that might give you some sense of whether you're succeeding or failing. But even that would be pretty crude because, for example, if you were in an expanding economy, uh, undoubtedly consumers' lives are getting better. Uh, and that may have nothing to do with the CFPB. So we, we tended to have more local types of data that you looked at. Uh, we looked at uh, the extent to which uh, consumer complaints were being handled and what kind of relief they were getting. That was helpful to us and gave us a sense that we were making a difference for people. Uh, our enforcement actions, and of course there were many ripe targets to begin with in terms of people doing things wrong and violating the law because they had been getting away with it for years. Uh, putting money back in people's pockets became a measure for us and we would constantly update that on the website. It ended up being $12 billion. We recovered for more than 30 million Americans over six years. 
far more than the Bureau spent on its own operations. And by the way, every time you put money back in people's pockets but stop a practice that was costing them money, you are saving them money in the future as far as the eye can see at the same rate. So again, those, there's a multiplier effect there as well. Um, we could see too, and some of this was impressionistic, but uh, as we put in place these mortgage rules to safeguard the mortgage market, it became a better market. And that was acknowledged even by those who were subject to the rules uh, over time. In fact, interestingly, uh, there's a case in the Supreme Court about the constitutionality of the CFPB leadership structure. And in the briefs that were filed in the case, the Mortgage Bankers Association filed a brief in which they said to the court, whatever else you do, they said, don't interfere with the ongoing processes of the Bureau and its, and its rulemaking function because if these mortgage rules were thrown up in the air again, uh, that would really be terrible for the market. Everybody's gotten used to them. Everybody's adjusted to them. They fostered confidence in the market and they made it a, made it a better and safer market. That was a pretty good uh, indicator that we had, had done a pretty good job in that area. But you kind of cast about for ways to measure yourself that aren't uh, perfect and certainly aren't comprehensive uh, and take your bearings uh, from that. I used to say that uh, I wished that I could be the head of the CFPB some years down the road when our research arm would have been up and running for a while and had all the data and could give us a much better picture of things. We had to kind of, uh, you know, grope around in, in greater darkness uh, and feel our way and, and make our best judgments uh, without some of that data that we were working to get over the long run. I think every FinTech CEO can, uh, can at least thank you for that research. So I've, I've used it many times and, and I know many people that have as well. Uh, so we've got one question um, from Matt and his question is, I know the CFPB has created a number of finance tools for consumers to help finance slash regulatory terms into more plain language. Are there more programs being implemented for that purpose, uh, including cryptocurrencies? Yeah, this was something that we stressed from the very beginning. It was one of Elizabeth Warren's uh, big uh, initiatives that she brought to the Bureau as we were just starting up, which was what we called Know Before You Owe, that one of the things that we should be trying to do is take the, the dense fine print of consumer financial contracts and try to translate them better into clearer, more intelligible, uh, key point disclosures so that consumers could actually work with them in a practical uh, way. Uh, you know, for the average consumer, uh, and, it, and it used to be true, this was true um, uh, 15, 20 years ago, the average credit card contract typically ran about 30 pages of dense fine print. Who on earth reads through that? Or if they do read through it, and if it's set at a 15th, 16th grade reading level, can actually make sense of it. And who can tell what's important from what's unimportant? You know, that's very difficult to do. We actually set out to simplify disclosures and clarify them for consumers in the fields of mortgage, credit cards, auto loans, and student loans. I think we had the most success in mortgages uh, and, and maybe next in credit cards. And that was in part because in the mortgage area, Congress gave us authority and, and in fact required us to adopt new rules to overhaul the disclosures. So, you know, everybody knew we had to do that. But it gave us time to do testing, to actually offer different disclosures to consumers and see what they understood and what they didn't understand, where they were able to grasp it better and where not. And we really were able to do a lot of research that helped uh, form a product that was a much better product and that everybody acknowledged. Uh, the uh, disclosures uh, around mortgage applications and mortgage closings got much better over this time and really prevented a lot of uh, nasty surprises that consumers were having at the closing table or even afterwards because they hadn't quite realized what was in the, the mortgage terms that they were uh, signing up for. Do you have time for two more questions? Sure. All right. Um, so you've done this question from Dan, you've done so many great things. You know, you're the AG of Ohio, the director of the CFPB. You now have this book. Uh, what's, what's next? 
Well, right now I'm trying to promote the book, so certainly I'd be uh, gratified if uh, some number of those who are on this uh, webinar would uh, buy the book and or encourage and recommend it to others. Uh, I do think it's an interesting and important story, and it provides a lot of insight into the thinking of a regulatory agency, and maybe the CFPB's thinking was different or more innovative than, than the established agencies. Probably that was true to some extent because we were just starting out and we could, could try to do things in new ways. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, that's uh, certainly uh, something that's absorbing a fair amount of my time. Uh, I have become kind of a uh, commentator and uh, speaker on consumer finance topics around the country. Uh, speaking at various conferences. I do a lot of op-eds and things. Uh, in California, I'm working with a consumer coalition to try to help get the state of California to adopt a, an analog to the CFPB in their state government. That's in the governor's, Governor Newsom's budget proposal. Uh, he's a real consumer advocate and he saw the need for this and frankly sees the need for it even more now that the COVID crisis is causing consumers so much pain. Uh, and we're trying to get that through. The governor's budget has to be passed by June 15th, so we're working on that uh, as we speak. Uh, and I'm doing doing a little bit of consulting here and there, uh, and and some other things. So uh, right now, helping uh, I would say manage. Others would say stay out of my way. A household of uh, locked down uh, students and a teacher uh, who are trying to fulfill their semester responsibilities and keep me from annoying them too much. Can I just double click on the, um, the, the California uh, CFPB uh, concept? You know, as, um, as a CEO of a FinTech company, do, do we need to start worrying about having, you know, 50 different AGs to deal with versus just unified federal statutes around consumer protection for finance? I think every business has to worry about that. It's not unique to fintechs or to consumer finance. Uh, it's been true for centuries that in America, you know, if you're a corporation, you might have different corporate laws from one state to another. You have different employment laws from one state to another. Uh, you have different tax laws from one state to another. And that's a, that's a kind of heavy burden to put on businesses, especially if they aim to be national in scope or international in scope. And now that you have these internet businesses that are borderless, uh, it is one of the complaints we heard frequently about our system in the United States, which is this federalism is so uh, burdensome and it's so complex and, and having to respond to different laws in different states, you know, it'd be a lot easier if there were just one, you know, people deride a one size fits all solution, but boy, there are a lot of companies who would prefer to have one size and one source of law and not have to deal with 50 states. But in our system of federalism, you do deal with 50 states. And in the Dodd-Frank Act uh, for consumer finance, it very much uh, doubled down on that by saying that federal law, if, it, it, if it's inconsistent with state law, and that's often a source of federal law preempting state law, and you end up with just one uniform rule, it said in consumer finance, if federal law is inconsistent with state law, but state law is more protective of consumers then the state law can operate, even if it's different from federal law. So you really have to look around and you have to meet the highest threshold of, of a state. This is happening right now, by the way, in other areas, that the new privacy law that California enacted that took effect at the beginning of the year uh, is setting sort of the highest bar on privacy. Uh, and everybody's really having to meet it because you can't really operate a business in the United States and not operate within the state of California. You don't even know as an internet business necessarily where your customers are or where they're moving to or where they're doing business from one day to the next. Uh, and so you really have to take account of what's being done across the country. Uh, and that's hard. Uh, and, it's, and it's hard uh, at times for, for the Bureau to deal with as well. Uh, but it's it's unavoidable. So one one um, last question from uh, Chris. He says many fintechs build their businesses meeting the needs of underserved consumers that banks have ignored. Are there any common problems of lower income consumers 
that, that you wish startups or banks would address, but thus have far have not? Well, I would say that there's a lot of problems. First of all, low income consumers have a lot of problems. They face a lot of problems. And there are plenty of people who don't seem to mind uh, adding to their load by engaging in predatory conduct toward them. Uh, and it's been true for years. It goes back to a, a book David Kaplanovitz uh, published in the early 60s called The Poor Pay More. Uh, it's been a phenomenon for a long time, whether it's layaway or rent to own or, or various uh, costly schemes. Um, but I would say that I, th I see fintech companies beginning to address a lot of these uh, issues uh, and providing uh, financial products that are that can build on com computer technology uh, and, and big data to uh, be to, to take some of those costs and return some cost savings to the consumer. Uh, I think certainly prepaid cards, for example, are, are an example of uh, an industry that has grown dramatically because it is meeting the needs of consumers in a way that consumers like. Uh, but um, you know, safe bank accounts potentially uh, add add to uh, consumer welfare. Uh, lower cost lending, certainly lower than payday loans, which are extortionate in my view, uh, are are making uh, more credit available to uh, more consumers at a more affordable uh, more affordable price. Um, you know. The, we talked earlier about alternative data being used to qualify more people for credit, probably doing so more accurately, which is important, uh, but also widening the net of people who can access credit. That helps people. Credit creates risk for people, but it creates opportunity. And without the opportunity, it's very hard to make progress. And if you're going to try to do something, you often need to borrow a bit of money to do it. And if you can do it in a way that is uh, more calibrated so that the loan will succeed, then that's better for you. Uh, but anyway, you name it across the spectrum of different consumer needs, and you can find fintech companies that are meeting those needs in, in what I think are better ways. And often the banks and big financial companies end up swallowing them up because they realize, yes, you are doing a better job than we're doing, and we'd like to, we'd like to go together with you in either a joint venture or, or a purchase uh, and that's, that's what's happening to a certain number of fintech companies. And there's nothing wrong with that. That, that can be a, a good trajectory and it can end up uh, benefiting uh, consumers. But there's lots of different paths, lots of different opportunities. Uh, and uh, it, again, it will continue to be a difficult area, but one that has a lot of promise. Um, Ole just asked one question, which is, what, what are your thoughts of financial wellness influencers that have become somewhat popular recently? Uh, how big is the risk of misinformation in a medium where many consumers are learning? Well, I think the danger with influencers is, are they, are they neutral? Are they expert? Uh, are they giving good information? Or is the information that they're giving either flawed in some respect, or is it biased because there's some sort of financial um, arrangement that we're not aware of. You know, there's, there's a lot of concern around financial influencers. And this, you know, goes back to there are, there are well-known people who give financial advice and are, are gain the trust of the public and hopefully don't abuse that trust. Uh, but I would say that um, it's a mixed bag uh, of the influencers. Uh, but the good ones understand that if you give good information and you can be reliable over time, then you're going to have a sustainable business model, uh, and and hopefully they're driving out those who uh, are are willing to cut corners to um, to build a market uh, and and not really looking to cultivate that market in a reliable or trusting trustworthy way over time. So my last question is where where can I get Watchdog? You can get Watchdog uh, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or at Oxford University Press or any of your local bookstores can order it uh, if, or they may have it in stock. Uh, so pretty much anywhere. Uh, you can see it behind me. That's the cover of Watchdog. It has a foreword by Senator Elizabeth Warren, who again was the original champion of the concept of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And again, there's, there's a lot of interesting things I think to learn in the book about the story of consumer finance, the story of this agency, what it's like to be uh, 
in, in the mindset of a, of a regulator dealing with these issues and what kind of challenges consumers face. And by the way, every page that talks about challenges consumers face is a page that offers an opportunity for someone who can address that challenge in a way that benefits consumers. There's a business model there to be had, I think. I, I could talk to you for the next couple of hours, you know, as I'm having so much fun. I just want to say thank you so much, um, Mr. Cordry, for everything that you've, uh, that you've done. And thank you for spending some time with us. Um, and please, everybody who's still listening, uh, get, get the book. It's a fascinating read. It's, it's a quick read, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, say thank, thank you so much. And hope you have a, uh, hope you have a great week. Hope you are, are safe. So thank you. I enjoyed this. Thanks to everyone uh, who took part. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good one.